I'd like to welcome you to our program, Truth For Today. I'm Pastor Steve Carr of Calvary Chapel in Arroyo Grande. Today we live in confusing times. However, God's Word can be a tremendous source of strength and guidance to those who believe. I'd like to invite you to join with us as we study through God's inspired Word. God has many truths He would like to communicate to you, but His greatest desire is that you might know Him and the love He has for you. He spoke through the prophet Jeremiah and said, I have loved you with an everlasting love. These words reveal how long he has loved you and how much he cares. If you will open your heart to him, I am confident that he will reveal himself to you and greatly encourage you today. Luke chapter 4, and we're going to begin with verse 31 this morning and looking through the end of this chapter. Now this particular text is really interesting because it covers a day and a half in the life of Christ. And so this could really be entitled A Day in the Life of Jesus. What was it like? How did he minister? What took place in his particular day? Now this particular text looks at the tireless servanthood of Christ. And as you read through this, you'll see what I mean. This man served with all his heart and reached multitudes of people. Read with me verse 31. Then he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbaths. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word was with authority. Now in the synagogue there was a man who had a spirit of an unclean demon. And he cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know you, who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him in their midst, it came out of him and did not hurt him. So they were all amazed and spoke among themselves, saying, What a word this is! For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And the report about him went out into every place in the surrounding region. Now it's interesting that Jesus comes down to the city of Capernaum. That was his home base, so to speak. He stayed there. He comes back to Capernaum after he goes out around into the other cities. And you'll see this over and over again through the Gospels. Capernaum was his home base, not Nazareth. Because Nazareth had rejected him, as we saw earlier in this chapter. He comes into the synagogue and his particular method of ministry was to start in the synagogue and to preach and teach there. It's interesting that it says here they were astonished at his teaching for his word was with authority. What gave Jesus this different quality of ministry other than the scribes and the Pharisees? You will see many times in the Gospels that he taught them not as the scribes and Pharisees. 
What was the difference? Why is there this reference to his authority in teaching? Well, first the scribes and the Pharisees usually, and when they taught, they quoted other rabbis. And this was not the method of Jesus. Jesus quoted the Word of God. And so there's a big difference between quoting other men and quoting the Scripture. But it was also the Word taught with the power of the Holy Spirit. And that was, again, a second great difference between Jesus and the scribes and the Pharisees. Paul refers to his own teaching and really, the, which shows the parallel between someone anointed by God to teach and preach versus someone who is not. In 1 Thessalonians 1.5, he said, Our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance. So Paul taught with the same kind of authority, and he identifies this authority as with the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what gave Jesus his authority. That's what gives you your authority. So the next time when you have an opportunity, somebody asks you at work, somebody asks you in a family meeting or something, what do you believe about Jesus? And all of a sudden your heart grips you in fear. And you say, what am I going to say? How am I going to respond? You need to quietly cry out to the Holy Spirit and say, Lord, help me, anoint me, empower me to communicate your word. And you will sense in your heart that boldness, that love, that encouragement to speak forth. And God will begin to give you words and to explain why you believe. This is the, the result of whoever will ask. If you ask for his power, he will give it to you. That's what Jesus said. Everyone that asks, it shall be given. And so just, I challenge you, I, I encourage you, ask for his power, and he will give it to you. It's interesting that Paul also, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he said that his preaching was not with men's wisdom, not with men's understanding. He wasn't using human rationales for his teaching. He said, but he, he said, I came in the power of the Spirit. And he said, in demonstration of the Spirit and power. And so, clearly, the apostles spoke with this kind of authority, using the Scripture and being anointed by the Spirit. It's interesting that also the Scripture declares that this is what he did. This is the primary part of his ministry. It was teaching. The healing and the driving demons out of people's bodies was a secondary thing to the healing. The teaching comes first. And they are amazed, astonished at his teaching. But also notice down in verse 36, so they were all amazed and spoke among themselves saying, what a word is this? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits and they come out. Not only were they astonished at his teaching, but they were astonished at his ability to command demons to come out of a person's body and the person was delivered. He spoke the word and it was done. And so they were amazed at his teaching and amazed at his ability to deliver people of demonic influence. Now let's just talk about demon possession for a minute because people ask me about this all the time. Do you really believe that somebody can really be possessed and inhabited by a demonic force? Is this something that takes place today? Do we believe that? And these are really good questions to ask. What is a demon? Well, notice first he declares in verse 33, Now in the synagogue there was a man who had a spirit of an unclean demon. Now, many say, well, 
why does he say unclean demon? Are there clean demons? And, and it's a good question. But you have to remember that Luke is primarily writing to a Greek audience. And the Greeks did believe that there were good demons. Just as today, many speak about white witches and white magic versus black magic, you see. A witch is a witch. Magic is a ma as magic. It's, it's all the same. It doesn't make any difference whether it's white or black. It's demonic. And there are, especially today in our society with the books that are out, the movies, you look at some of the cartoons that are on that your kids want to watch, and I say, I don't want that on in my house. Turn it off, because this is so demonic. Spirits and putting spells on people and all this crazy stuff that is feeding our children with this understanding of the demonic. It is a real thing, and it is something that you have to understand. Demons are fallen angels. How do we know that? Well, two passages in Matthew 12, verse 24. There it says the Pharisees heard Jesus was commanding demons to come out, and they said, this fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of demons. Now, Beelzebub is another term for Satan. So, the Pharisees said of Jesus, he's casting out demons by the prince of demons, the guy who rules all demons. Does that clarify that he rules all demons? Yes. But again, what is it this, who are these that he rules over? Again, in Matthew 25, 41, Jesus said that there will be people or that he will say to those, depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So clearly, the Bible teaches that Satan fell and disobeyed God in rebellion against him, but angels, other angels, went with him. Demons are fallen angels, not the spirits of people who have departed this life. There is a big difference, and that's a common belief, that that's what demonic, the demonic is. Or demons are ghosts of somebody that used to live in this house. Well, that's not true. If they died and they did not know Christ, I guarantee you they are not living still in that house. They are in another place. And there may be demonic forces in that house, okay? But it is not the souls of those who have departed. Demons seek to inhabit human bodies. That is clear, or this man would not have been possessed by a demon. Now, let me, just before I go any further, I want to assure all of you who are believers here, you cannot be demon possessed. Okay? You cannot have a demon inhabit your body because you are a Christian. Now when I was a young Christian, I just, gosh, a year or two old in the Lord, and some guy came up and said, you gotta be careful, you know, don't don't sin, don't have evil thoughts in your head, you you might get a demon. And you know, they they would encourage people to cough out these demons. So every time I started to cough, I wondered if I was coughing out a demon. <laughs> Until somebody got a hold of me and started sharing with me what the scripture said, that this is not a biblical concept. Christians cannot be demon-possessed. Many today say, well, you can be demonized. And I, that's not the same as demon-possessed. And they use the, the Greek word demonizo. But that word, demonizo, is translated demon-possessed in the scripture. There is no difference between demonized or demon-possessed. And so people use a play on words to try and basically teach the same concept. It is not a biblical truth. In 1 John 5, 18, it says this. We know, and I hope you know this, we know that whoever is born of God 
does not continually practice sin. That is the meaning of that, the tense of the verb there. It says, but he who has been born of God keeps himself or continually keeps himself. Again, it's in the present tense. And the wicked one does not touch him. Now this word touch here literally means to take hold of and take and grasp and hold on tightly. Uh, this is the same thing, the same word used when Jesus said to Mary, don't touch me. Or in other words, she had a death grip on him. Okay? And he's saying, don't grasp me, don't hold on to me like this. And so it is declaring here that if you are born again, you are not going to continually practice sin. You are going to continually be resisting sin, keeping yourself. And it also declares that the wicked one has no right to lay hold of you anymore. You are free from his grasp. In Colossians 1.13, it says that He, referring to Jesus, has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. Now the word power there, He has delivered us from the power of darkness, is a Greek word that means authority, right, influence. He has delivered us from, Satan, from the right that Satan had over us once, from the influence he had over us once, from the authority he had over us once. And he has placed us in his kingdom, which now means he has the right, the influence, the authority over me and over all those that believe in him. Now you say, but wait a minute, Steve, if... He has uh, delivered me from his authority. Well, what, what's going on in my life when I get tempted or I'm in the middle of spiritual warfare? If I'm delivered, what's happening then? Well, he's trying to exert authority where he does not have it. And he does that through his primary method, lies. He lies to you. And he's a good liar. He's very effective at it. And we believe the lies and we get caught because of it. And so, yet the scripture also tells us that he speaks the truth. Notice in this text that the, the, demons, uh, the demons spoke a truth here. He said, you are Jesus of Nazareth. What have we to do with you? You're the Holy One of God. So the devil can speak truth to you just like he did to Jesus in the earlier part of Luke 4 when we looked at the temptations of Christ. What did Satan do? He quoted the Word of God to Jesus. He quoted the Word of God and he quoted it out of context. And that is an important truth because he will tell you the truth all the time. He's very good at it. You failed. You're a sinner. You blew it big time. Look at how bad you are. That's all true. But the rest of what he has to say is, you should just not even go to church. You should just give up. You should just pass on the Christian life because you're a failure. You'll never make it. Well, all of that is a lie because the Lord says to me that the work he starts in me, he is going to finish. And yes, I may fail. Yes, I may stumble. You stumble. You fail. But he is going to fulfill his work in and through you. That is the truth. The work that he has begun, he will finish. Now notice also, he spoke another truth here in our text. He said, did you come to destroy us? And what's the answer to that? Yes. That's exactly what he came to do. Notice that the the devil and these, this demon know their end. There's another passage in the Gospels where the demon said, have you come to destroy us before our time? You see, they know what their ultimate end is. And that is clearly acknowledged here. Yes, he came to destroy them, to destroy their authority over your life. 
in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. It says, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he, Jesus, might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Now notice it says, through death he was to destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Now note this. This word destroy here is a Greek word that literally means to render inactive or to render impotent. And so this is what gives you the understanding that he doesn't have any right over me any longer because the Lord has broken his right to rule over me, to grasp hold of me in any way. And so, note this, this truth. This is the victory that you have in Christ Jesus. And this is the authority that he wants you to possess. You see, every one of you in this room has the same authority over demonic forces that Jesus had. Why? Because you have Jesus living in you. And you have the authority of Jesus' name. This is what Jesus said to his disciples in Luke 10, 19. He said, Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you in this spiritual conflict that we are in. Nothing will hurt me. Nothing can overcome me because I have been given the authority of Jesus name. Now some of you have seen movies that deal with exorcism and you know many of these movies you you see the you know the person you know they take this symbol of the cross and they shove it in the person's face as if that has some power. Some symbol of a cross has absolutely no power to deliver anyone from a demonic force. It is the person who hung on that cross that has the power to deliver somebody of a demon. It's the power of the name of Jesus that hung on that cross that has the power to deliver somebody from a demon. That's it. And so put your faith in the authority that has been given to you in the name of Jesus. He said, in my name, cast out demons. That's what he told his disciples. You're a disciple. And if you know him personally, you have been given that authority. But the issue is, is do you exercise that authority over the demonic, or the, and especially when you're in the midst of spiritual warfare? Do you exercise your authority as a believer? I believe this is so important. You may not see someone who is demon-possessed, but I guarantee you, you're going to have demons come around you and you're going to be tempted and influenced. You're going to get into spiritual warfare because Ephesians 6 makes that very clear. That's going to happen. Paul said, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, spiritual wickedness in high places. He said, so you better put your armor on. Now, you put that armor on and all of that armor is listed there. One aspect of that armor is the very last thing he says, praying in the Spirit with all perseverance. You see, prayer in, and with a prayer of faith in the Word of God is what is it's in the sword of the Spirit that gives you that victory. Do you take that authority over the lies that come into your mind do you command the demonic forces that are around you in Jesus' name to cease their activity around you, around your friends and your family? You should. The scripture says that we should bind the strong man lest he gain an advantage. So take the authority that you have in Christ's name. In Acts 16, verse 18, Paul, knowing this authority, is when a woman who had a demon within her 
This is why he said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. He didn't say, I command you in the name of Paul. He said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out. And the scripture declares to us there, and he came out that very hour. And so you have authority in Christ's name. Use it. Now this next section, verse 38 and 39, very short uh, little text of scripture. He says, Now he arose from the synagogue and entered Simon's house, but Simon's wife's mother was sick with a high fever, and they made request of him concerning her. So he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she arose and served them. Now note here that there was an instantaneous healing that was visible, and it was proven that she was healed of this fever because obviously she got up and she started to serve them immediately. Now, I believe this is an important truth because as Christians that believe in divine healing, and we believe that God heals, I find that many times Christians try and work up a healing. They're, they're saying, if, if I say that I'm healed even when I feel unhealed, that that will make me healed. And there are many that even teach that. They say you have to confess your healing before you will actually be healed. And so basically that turns healing into kind of a works-oriented kind of a thing. You have to work it up. If I say it enough, then it'll come to pass. That is not what takes place here. Jesus speaks the word and it's done. It's, it's an instantaneous thing. You don't have to try and work yourself up to be healed. Either you are or you aren't. It's that simple. If I pray for someone and they, they say, you know what, I'm, I'm just still hurting. Well, I know that they are not healed. If somebody says, that, that, just, that pain just left me. Instantly I go, well, praise God, let's rejoice. God touched you and miraculously healed you. It will be visible. It will be obvious. Don't try and work it up. The second thing that's in this text that I think is important is that Jesus didn't touch her. He just rebuked the fever by his word. So now we have the authority of his word to teach and the authority of his word to heal. Very important. He spoke it and it was done. Just as he spoke into existence the heavens and the earth, just as he said, light be, light was. And Jesus does the same. He does not touch her. Other times he takes people up in their arms or he makes a, a you know, takes some spit and some you know, dirt and makes clay and puts it on their eyes. I mean, there's a different way that Jesus heals every single time. But this is an important understanding that he can just speak it and it's done. Why is that so important? Well, in Matthew 8, verse 8, there you remember the centurion that came to Jesus and said, would you heal my servant? And he said, you don't even have to come under my, the roof of my house. If you just speak the word, it will be done. And Jesus remarked and said, I have not found such great faith in all of Israel. So what he was declaring was the statement of this man to believe, who is a Gentile, a centurion, a Roman centurion, a Gentile that believed that he could just say it and it would be done. Do you believe that? Do you believe that you have to actually be someplace and actually lay hands on someone for that to take place? Do you, or do you believe that you can just speak the word and it's done? You cry out to him, you ask him, and he will speak the word and that person will be healed. I don't speak words that heal. He speaks words that heal. An important distinction. Again, many in the church have gone overboard in that belief system.
Now also, one other thing that's kind of a side note in this, the scripture clearly reveals here that Peter was married. You can't have a mother-in-law unless you've married somebody that has a mother. You see? So for those that see celibacy as something that is good, basing it on Peter, those priests that say, we're not going to marry, based on the fact that Peter, the first pope, was not married, does not hold up in Scripture. Peter was married, and he had a mother-in-law, okay, that he healed, clearly here. I think that when you meet people like that, you need to share with them that they're not basing their beliefs on Scripture, but on church tradition, and that's it. And that's a dangerous thing to do. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, God is the one who said over and over again, it is good. When he finished his creation, it is good, it is good, it is good. But in Genesis 2.18, he said, it is not good that man should live alone. And so it is not good for a pastor or a priest to try and do something that is contrary to nature, contrary to what God has intended. And that is clearly taught in Scripture. Now last, this last section, verse 40 through 44, Jesus' day is not over yet. He's taught in the synagogue. He's healed this man who is demon-possessed. He's gone thinking maybe he's going to relax, have lunch at Peter's house. He ends up ministering to Peter's mother-in-law. And then he sits down probably at dusk thinking, well, we'll just have a quiet night here and have dinner and enjoy ourselves. It says in verse 40, Now when the sun was setting, all those who had anyone sick with various diseases brought them to him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons also came out of many, crying out and saying, You are the Christ, the Son of God. And he rebuked them and did not allow them to speak or to say that they knew him, for they knew that he was the Christ. Now when it was day, he departed and went into a deserted place, and the crowd sought him and came to him and tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, because for this purpose I have been sent. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Galilee. Now notice that the sun is setting. And all of a sudden, the whole city comes alive. Now why is this? Well, the, when the sun sets, the Sabbath is over. And when the Sabbath is over, the people can now pick up those that are sick, those that are lame, those that are blind, and carry them without breaking the Sabbath and carry them to the door of Peter's house. And Jesus opens the door, and he looks out, and the scripture tells us in Mark, in chapter uh, 1, verse 33, that the whole city was gathered together outside of his door. That is not revealed here in Luke. But Mark is very clear about it. The whole city brought everybody that was sick and said, we want you to heal. We want you to touch. We want you to set them free from the, the demons that are within them. And Jesus did it. Now the scripture doesn't tell us how long he ministered. But I'll bet you if you had the whole city hanging outside your door, you'd be ministering for a long time. And he ministered most likely into the night. The important thing to note is that he got up in the morning and he left to go out to a deserted place. And the people were still there because they tried to prevent him. They went and sought him, found him, and said, Oh, don't leave Capernaum. Come back. You can see this also in Mark's Gospel, uh, that it says in chapter 1, verse 35, that Jesus went out into this deserted place to do one thing, and that was to pray. It says he went out to pray to his Father. Now, isn't it interesting that Jesus thought, even being the Son of God, 
that after a long, hard day of ministry, that he needed to pray. I think that's a pretty important example. And he was willing to even lose some sleep to do it. He was willing to get up a little early to spend that time. Many times I share with people, this is the most important part of my day. It's the most important part of your day. It is your morning. And what you do in that, those few minutes before you head off for the day is a very important thing. And if you have to lose a little sleep, I would encourage you to do it. Because it, prayer and getting into the Word is an essential thing to keep you strong. If you are stressed out, that only tells you you need to do it all the more. Jesus was probably stressed, physically tired from the long day. He was a man. He had a physical body. It was not a tough, not an, not an easy thing for him, but a tough thing. And so he went out to pray. This is why Jesus said in Luke 18.1, he taught a parable that men ought always to pray and not to lose heart. So if you feel like losing heart, you need to pray. Because that's how you build yourself up, as Jude tells us, in your most holy faith. To build yourself up, pray. To build yourself up, get into the Word. And you will be strengthened. Now notice that Jesus commands here these demons not to speak and to reveal that He is the Son of God. Why is that? This is another question that I get from people all the time. In fact, two weeks ago, somebody asked me this very question as they left our, the service. They said, why? Why did He tell them that not to speak and declare that you're the Christ, the Son of the living God, the Holy One of God? Why would He want to stop that? Why doesn't He want everybody to know who He is? Well, first off, there are several reasons. The first is that Scripture declares in Psalm 50, verse 16, God says to the wicked, what right have you to declare my statutes or take my covenant in your mouth? What right? He says, I don't want you talking about my covenant when you don't even believe in my covenant. Now that's what he says to those who are unbelievers. How much more would we want the prince of demons or any demonic force ever taking the word of God in their mouths or declaring anything about him. The second reason is that for the specific cause, Jesus didn't want to be associated with the devil in any way. As you read further on in the Gospels, you realize that they would constantly say, as we read this morning, Jesus, you're casting out demons by the prince of demons, Beelzebub. Remember that passage we read earlier? So they, they were trying to make this connection between Satan and Jesus in the first place. And Jesus didn't want any connection between himself and any demonic force. But third, Jesus only wanted people to believe based on what they saw him do personally and what they heard him teach personally. This is clear. He wants people to believe him for the work's sake. He wants them to believe him because the words that he spoke were in harmony with the scripture. And we went over that passage in our previous study last week. And so it's essential that you see here he wanted to have nothing to do with these demonic forces. Now the last thing, note when they try and keep Jesus from departing. What does he say to them here? He says, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities. Now this is that statement that Jesus makes throughout his ministry. It's a statement that I drew your attention to when we started the Gospel of Luke in Luke chapter 2 verse 49 when he said, I must be about my father's business. Remember we talked about that? Well, here he says, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities. 
This was a divine, divinely motivated must in Jesus' heart. This is important. Here are some other passages where he makes this statement. In John 10, 16, he declares there, Other sheep I have which are not of this fold, referring to the Gentiles. Them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. He said, I must bring them. This was the divine imperative in the heart of Jesus. In John 9, 4, he said there, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. In Jesus' heart, he had this divinely inspired must. Now, I apply this to you personally. Do you have a divinely inspired must in your soul? To work, to serve in some manner within the kingdom of God. I believe that this is an important thing because this divinely inspired must in the heart of a believer motivates them forward. They know what they're called to do and they go do it. And they do it tirelessly. They do it persevering through tough times. And they do it because they know God has called them to do it. Do you know what your work is? It says in Mark 13, 34, Jesus said in a parable that he left his house and gave authority to his servants. There it is again, that same concept. You have been given authority by him. And it says he left his house, gave authority to his servants to, and to each his work and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. So every one of us as believers has been given a work to do. It might be a, a work and ministry of prayer. It might be a work and ministry of service somewhere. It might be a work and ministry of evangelism, teaching, what, whatever helps. God has called you to serve Him, and He's gifted you to do that. It says in 1 Peter 4.10, As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So if you're to be a good steward of God's grace, you have to determine what your gift is and then exercise that gift in the work that He wants you to fulfill. So what is that? If you know what that gifting is, are you fulfilling it? If you don't know what that gifting is and that work that He wants you to perform, will you at least pray and seek His face and say, Lord, show me, what do you want me to do? I want that divinely inspired must in my heart so that I can do what you've called me to do. And when I stand before you, you will say, well done, good and faithful servant. I gave you this and you did it. Don't you want to hear those words? But that requires you to ask him what that gifting is and what that work is that he wants you to perform and fulfill it because he wants to bless you. He has a work for you and that is clear from scripture. He has a gift for you and he wants to bestow that upon you because he wants you to bless and encourage and build up his body and to reach the lost around this world. That is his desire. So please, I encourage you, take this to heart, apply it. Ask the Lord to give you that sense of authority in Christ's name that you might be victorious in the struggles and the spiritual warfare that you encounter. Ask the Lord to show you what that work is that He wants you to fulfill and then go do it. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Thank you for joining us. I want to encourage you to apply what you've heard today and mix God's Word with faith. Believe His promises. Obey His commands. Take the action God requires and God will begin to work in your life. If you have never made a commitment to Christ, I want to encourage you to make that decision today by asking God to forgive you 
Invite Christ into your heart. Turn from any known sin and begin to walk with him daily. Jesus said, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. If you would like someone to pray with you, please call our office at the number on your screen, and someone will be there to help. Or in a moment, you will see a simple prayer on your screen that you can pray. Just pray that prayer from your heart sincerely, and God will hear you. However you make your commitment, do it today. God bless you, and join us again next week for Truth For Today.